Uh, I wondered what the laughing was at. The Bible is full of terrible, awful stories, especially in the Hebrew scriptures. There are stories of rape, torture, horrific murders, even the wholesale slaughter of innocents, all in the name of God and apparently even at the direction of God. Really ugly, terrible passages. We do our best to avoid talking about them. We prefer to think that our God would never condone such behavior. We like to read the New Testament because it's all about love and kindness and justice. Well, except for the book of Revelation. But that's clearly a dream. And Martin Luther and John Calvin both didn't think it ought to be in the Bible at all. And so we kind of can sort of ignore that a lot of the time. Remind me sometime to tell you about how my encounter with the book of Revelation kept me away from church for another four or five years. But that's for another day. But aside from that book, the New Testament is filled with stories about our dear, loving Jesus, a forgiving God who only wants to be reconciled with us, and a series of letters teaching us how to be church. There are some bits where people treat each other terribly. Stephen is stoned to death for blasphemy because he believes in Jesus. Saul runs around trying to have all the Jesus followers imprisoned. Christians are imprisoned and persecuted and executed and tortured. And of course, Jesus himself is tortured and crucified. But God is always good and loving and forgiving and strikes Ananias and his wife Sapphira dead for lying about their giving to the church. Wait a minute, what? Yep, not just Ananias, but also his wife Sapphira. Later in the day, she showed up and she also lied about that piece of land and how much they got for it. And she also was struck down dead on the spot. And the story ends with this line. And great fear seized the whole church and everyone who heard of these things. This is one of those terrible passages that no one ever talks about. I mean, we hear stories all the time about how doing the right thing brings blessings. It's not uncommon to hear an offering meditation on how someone really couldn't afford to tithe and did anyway and somehow everything they needed was provided from, for them from some unexpected source. We hear these stories all the time. It's happened to many of us. The one thing we hardly ever hear is he lied about his giving and God struck him dead. If you ask me, this is probably one of the most poorly thought out stewardship campaigns in the history of the church. <laughs> I mean, think of the ramifications. Say you meet a friend in the street or save Mart and you want him to know about Jesus and the church. The conversation might go something like this. Hey friend, I want to tell you I belong to this awesome church. We all love each other and we welcome everybody and we go out into the community and help people who need help, even people who aren't part of our church. And we have these great worship services with amazing music and inspiring preaching from people who actually knew Jesus himself when he was walking among us. Would you like to come to worship with me next Sunday to learn about Jesus, meet all these great people? And then the person li listening, having heard about Ananias and Sapphira, says to himself, uh, yeah, right. And if I don't give the way their God thinks I ought to give, I get struck dead on the spot? I don't think so. And then he makes up some excuse or other for not coming with you to church. Huh. Probably not. There's a person I know who has asked me repeatedly whether or not this story is true. Did this really happen? Because, you know, God? Over money? Really? And my answer is always the same. I don't know. I mean, this 
book, the Acts of the Apostles, it is the closest thing we have to the history of the early years of the church. But it was, after all, written by one person who was relying on hearsay for much of what he was writing down. Many scholars believe that Luke was a very well-educated Gentile, a Greek, maybe a physician, who had converted to Judaism, which explains both the excellence of his writing and the particular worldview from which he writes. But he wouldn't have been present at many of the events described in this book. He would of necessity have relied on the testimony of those who had either been there or knew somebody who had been there. One of the clues we have is to the occasional inaccuracy of these stories comes from Paul's letters because Paul's letters were written much earlier than either the Gospels or the Acts of the Apostles, and they were written by the actual person who was doing these things, who was present at all the events being written about. Yet in a number of cases, Paul's account of events disagrees entirely with the Acts of the Apostles, with what Luke says Paul was doing at the time. So we have to consider that some of the stories in the Acts of the Apostles may not have been entirely accurate in the historical sense. It's not to say they don't contain truth, and that would be truth with a capital T. Merely that the data contained in them may not be entirely accurate. In much the same way that a household budget may contain some numbers that aren't correct, but the overall picture at the end remains the same. In the case of a household budget that is running in the red, it really doesn't matter if the cable bill was $60 or $160, if either way at the end of the month there is more money going out than coming in. The full title of today's message, as I had written down, is Share and Share Like, A Sermon on Stewardship. You all may not know this, but pastors tend to really dislike preaching stewardship sermons. It, I mean, we do it, we do, but it feels a bit self-serving, you know? I mean, give money so I can get paid. <laughs> Doesn't really encourage one to give an impassioned sermon, if you know what I mean. Especially if the congregation's budget is running in the red. But I chose this passage, even though it appears nowhere in the lectionary ever, because I think it makes an important point about the way we think about giving. Acts 5, verse 11 says, And a great fear, sorry, start again. And a great fear seized the whole church and all who heard these things. In some congregations, the people listened to the doomsayers. If we lose members, or if so-and-so stops giving, or if we don't cut expenses to the bone, we're going to die. And everybody gets scared. Because they don't want anything bad to happen. They don't want their church to dwindle and die. In most cases, where people listen to the doomsayers, the first budget items to get cut are outreach programs, you know, the Helping the People Who Need to Be Helped programs, and staff budgets. The focus of the congregation turns inward toward preserving the building, preserving the past, preserving the way things have always been. The people we rarely listen to, however, are the children. When you ask a child where they think the money goes that we collect on Sunday, they will nearly always say, unless of course I ask that question in front of people, they will nearly always say, to help people. They almost never say, to pay the electric bill. Children get why we give. Sometimes we forget. Children, by the way, also ask things like, so pastor, what do you do the rest of the week? <laughs> Sadly, so do some adults. <laughs> Follow me around next week and you'll know. We know that the 
early church wasn't worried about maintaining a building because they didn't have any. They were only concerned about spreading the good news of God's love, about helping people. Back to the story. I would like to believe that the grim story of Ananias and Sapphira is inaccurate. I would like to believe that maybe they wanted to die of embarrassment when they were caught lying about their giving, but not that God struck them dead where they stood. I think this is more of an allegorical story, that the death they suffered wasn't so much actual physical heart-stopping death but rather the death of the soul that comes with sin. I think it was more of a case of you're dead to us, so we are removing you from our presence than they were actually taken out by the young men and buried in the ground. That's what I think. What I'm pretty sure is true, however, because we see it all the time, is that a man named Barnabas gave a really hefty gift and his generosity was trumpeted around the congregation. Hey everybody, look here. Barnabas just gave a huge amount of money. Let us all applaud him and tell him how wonderful he is. What a great guy. And other people felt less than because they couldn't do that. I've had people tell me that they take tithing 10% so seriously that if they find a dime on the ground, they're going to give a penny. And I'm not even kidding. I know somebody who does that. Other people have told me that they quit tithing 10% years before and just gave as their hearts told them to. And from that day forward, forevermore, they got in trouble with the IRS every single year because they were always giving more than 10%. I may not believe that God will strike somebody dead for misreporting their income, but the IRS. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> for other people, giving 1% is a struggle. And great fear sees the whole church. When we are fearful, when giving becomes a matter for worry instead of something to be joyful about, then we are giving in to the kind of thinking that killed Ananias and Sapphira. I need to confess that before I came here, my giving, which was closer to 1% than 10%, was a matter of great concern and worry to me. I was upset at how it must look that the pastor of the congregation wasn't able to give as I thought I should not and also be able to pay my bills and pay rent and buy food and put gas in my car and, you know, live. We've been told that God loves a joyful giver, but how joyful can we be if we're trying to decide whether to give money for, to the church or buy groceries for our kids? It's a hard choice. Giving for me was far from joyful. Since coming here, that has changed. Being able to write a check for 10% of my paycheck is one of the great blessings I have received from coming to this place. However, it would have been better for me to be joyful about giving what I could give when I was not able to do this much and not worry so much about how it looked to other people. I believe that God only wants us to do the best that we can do, not the best that we think somebody else thinks we should do. I'm just not very good at remembering that. We'll be asked a little later in the service for our tithes and our offerings. And after that, during our annual meeting, we'll hear about the church budget and how much we need to, keep, to give in order to keep doing God's work in the world. Listen closely and consider if you yourself might be able to make changes in your giving. Remember that everything we have comes from God. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything we give to the doing of God's work in the world is already His. Whether our giving is in money or in the use of our time and our talents, we give Him only what is His own. May we give all that we have with great joy.
if you are not yet part of the body of Christ and wish to become his brother or sister through baptism, or if you are looking for a church home and want to become part of the family of Christ that is here at First Christian Church, or if you wish to take this opportunity to recommit yourself to Christ, you're invited to come forward during the singing of We Give Thee But Thine Own. 